according to some proponents of organizational degeneration, workplace democracy is claimed to be futile as rival bureaucratic organizations are technically superior. Due to isomorphic pressures, cooperatives would either engulf specialization and thus resort to oligarchy or fail. Likewise, successfully resisting degeneration has most often been presented as the challenge to avoid commercial failure and remain democratic. Following the aforementioned rationale, specialization is largely seen in the literature on radical cooperatives more as a problem and a challenge due to the supposed power asymmetries in their days. Overcoming the challenge is primarily seen as a race to equalize power, primarily through skill sharing and rotation. To show a case that specialization need not straightforwardly lead to oligarchy and to promote a deeper understanding of the challenges associated with managing different levels of expertise within horizontal collectives, I will focus on this presentation on the experience of cooperative management in two radical worker cooperatives. The motivation for the current research project stems from my involvement as a member of a small radical worker cooperative called Pakaki for more than 10 years. Throughout the years, my academic education, prior professional experience, and project management skills were invaluable, invaluable assets for the financial well-being of the cooperative, but also quite often a source of tension, as our skill sharing rotation strategy was not enough to arrive at a healthily balanced collective. In this presentation, I am also drawing from longitudinal participant observation conducted on another working cooperative in Greece, Sinalis, as part of a broader ethnographic research on the working cooperative network of patterns, of which both Pagaiki and Sinalis are founding members. Before going forward, let me provide with some more context on these two cases, which were also selected for outperforming the rest members of the network in terms of financial success. For additional information on the collectives and the recent emergence of a first wave of radical cooperatives in Greece, you can look into my thesis entitled Developing Theories and Tools for Resisting the Generation with the Workers' Cooperative Network of Athens, which is available online. So, Pagaki, on average, involving eight to 12 members, operates a coffee shop in Athens, Greece, since 2010, under self-management and adheres to the following principles. No top-down relations, no individual ownership, socializing profits, commitment to actively promoting worker self-management, consensus decision-making, equal pay, and being an anti-racist, anti-homophobic collective. Along these lines, all decisions were made in the General Assembly and has also tried to implement a skill sharing rotation strategy to avoid asymmetric relations erupting from being dependent upon experts. For instance, the food menu was purposefully designed so that all members could undertake it without being dependent upon a chef. Therefore, members of the collective were supposed to be some kind of competent waiters, baristas, DJs, chefs, and cleaners. Sinalis has also been a small a worker cooperative of about six persons, running a fair trade grocery shop in Thysio since 2011. A factional division of labor has been in place for key operations of the collective. Hence, apart from operating the store as a salesperson, each of the five to six members uh, have also a specialized role according to, to his or her preferences and skills, and this was highly mirrored in their self-image. Nevertheless, all major decisions were taken in the weekly assembly for consensus decision making, and all members were entitled to equal pay. Overall, then, Pagaki has uh, engulfed specialization primarily on secondary operations, while Sinalis has a, at its core a technical division of labor that was largely inherited by their members' prior involvement, involvement in a voluntary project that predated the formation of their collective. Moreover, both collectives were interested in developing, developing a skill sharing rotation strategy to a different extent. But this was easier said than done, as there was often a repulsion, a repulsion to certain tasks or very advanced skill requirements. Nevertheless, contrary to the pessimistic and deterministic views considering oligarchy as inevitable, both collectives have proven to be exemplars of collectivist democracy. After almost a decade of operating with a horizontal division of labor, the threat of oligarchy erupting from engulfing specialization has not materialized. As the assemblies were always meant to have the final say in decision, not the individual or any ad hoc task forces. Therefore, they both rightfully still deserve credit for that. However, there was plenty of room for improving the health of the collective, which is certainly not just remaining democratic and being relatively effective, 
in other words, not just to not uh, degenerate. For instance, in the case of Pagaki, coordination work was for the most part achieved in everyday rotated work, but beyond that, the organization was a black box, despite shared access to information. Likewise, in Sinalis, the outcome was this an execution of specialist tasks according to individual competencies, but also difficulty in intra-cooperation due to ignorance regarding the other's work and the based value on non-specialized tasks. When both collectives attempted, attempted to deal with some aspects of the above mentioned problems in a systematic way, they found themselves stuck by defective action strategies to deal with different levels of expertise, like counter developmental protective support, covering up individuals' failure, covering up the cover up, and so on. Pakaiki, for instance, decided to experiment with principles and tools derived from the viable system model and sociocracy. But due to the above culture of non-accountability, the system was very soon derailed. Moreover, it increasingly became evident that there were different needs and priorities, which were reflected in different implementation of the decision-making process. Retrospectively, it was evident that some favored predictability, while others spontaneity. Some opted for autonomy, while others longed for alignment and shared purpose. Few prioritized effectiveness and competence in workplace democracy, while the most prioritized self-expression and exploration. However, given that these differences were for too long, for too long undiscussable, there was no room for improvement, just increasing the dissonance. In this sense, it was once again confirmed that diagnosing adequately the cultural root causes of organizational problem, problems is a precondition to arrive at a healthy collective. Currently, there is an ongoing experimentation with the action science methodology that is so far improving the ability of the collective to discuss previously undiscussable topics and learn from mistakes. In light of this experience, Sinalis was both lucky to skip some debates that were for long skillfully avoided but no longer necessary when a member reached the retirement age, but also unlucky because the difficulty in discussing certain topics will most likely emerge when the time comes. So, what do we learn from this experience and what lessons do we learn for improving the health of worker cooperatives? Firstly, skill sharing rotation strategy is not a silver bullet for avoiding asymmetric relations. In other words, it is hopeless to expect that all members won't or can become experts in whatever field is necessary. It is nonetheless an indispensable part for sustaining a balanced members driven democratic cooperative, which offers development, developmental opportunities for their members. Secondly, Horizontal division of labor is not an oxymoron. Work collectives can and should utilize this distinct individual competence for the, benefit, for the benefit of the collective. Thirdly, securing democracy and avoiding commercial failure are just some challenges that cooperative management needs to deal with. Therefore, a health collective is not the result of a sufficiently democratic and effective cooperation. It is also a matter of a deeper alignment between members, a shared sense of belonging and agency. Fourthly, to be able to make an informed choice about an appropriate governance system that works for cooperators, it is important that the latter realize and take into consideration not only their own needs preferences, but the needs preferences of their colleagues, as well as the necessities of the environment. Moreover, adding safety values that take into consideration the different priorities and establishing a supportive environment for self-flexibility and frank communication are essential for avoiding dysfunction and we lose the dynamics. Fifthly, and this is my closing remark for this presentation, classic cooperative problems like difficulty in obtaining accountability from members, limits in equalizing influence, unproductive use of conflict and unproductive use of meetings are problems that are most often interdependent and constitute a weak problem. Therefore, they require systemic and not systematic efforts to better manage.